Glory Cloud Podcast, Episode 78. Well, stay tuned for more from Kingdom Prologue this week. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Todd Bordeaux. Welcome back, Todd. Um, it's always good to talk about Klein together. Two nerds get to sit around and talk about theology and kingdom prologue. This is about as good as it gets, don't you think? I think so. This is very good. So before Todd and I jump right into our discussion of kingdom prologue this week, I'll just run through our regular housekeeping uh, please do visit our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of the episode from uh, scripture passages to books to journal articles, all kinds of things. You can find it there. And if you purchase any materials from the links on the show notes page, you will help me out a little bit. So I sure would appreciate that. Um, if you have not yet rated us on iTunes, we would sure appreciate a five star rating that helps other people as they're looking for good theological content in their podcasts to find us. And one other thing that you can do is to subscribe to the show if you have not yet done that in whatever pod catching app that you use. Uh, if you have the means and you'd like to uh, pitch in some money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right hand side of the page. And we would also like to encourage you to continue to pray for Lee and Misty. Um, we, we miss Lee, but we want to support him in um, working on repairing his marriage. And I also want to encourage everyone to continue to pray for Fikret Bocek. Still don't have any update, but I'll let you know as I do. And this week, um, we would like to know more about our listeners. So... I've developed a short survey, and if you go to the show, no show notes page for this week's episode, you want to go to episode 78, you can find a link to the survey, and we would sure appreciate it if you would take the time to fill it out and give us your feedback. It's not very long, it won't take very much time, uh, but we would just like to know a little bit more about our listeners. So with that, Todd, would you like to maybe uh, give us a running start at this week's material by refreshing our memory about last week's episode. Sure. Klein has been developing as he's working through Genesis and especially chapters four and following uh, the place and limits of human government in a common grace society. Now that man has fallen and we're in this common grace world, um, what would be the institutions that would continue society and he's been focusing on family and then government and today he continues that idea of of human government the human common grace city and where it tends to go because of fallen man now this will be klein's last comments in the section in kingdom prologue specifically on the state or on human government or common grace government as we might call it Next week, he's going to move into um, the city of God and how the church developed um, you know, during the Common Grace Society, especially from Genesis 5 on. And so here in our chapter, he begins, and it's entitled The Apostate Malformation of the City. And so he begins by explaining how history is really a tale of two cities. Um, we have the heavenly city, the church, and the earthly city, or um, here, the common grace city, the development of man um, under the fall. And he goes on to say that Israel, once we move into the book of Exodus, becomes a sign, a type of the eternal city. So everything about Israel is, in one sense, typological. Israel is a picture of the final city of God that is intruded upon Old Testament reality in a picture. And then Klein moves on to say that the church in the New Covenant 
is the eternal city. The eternal city is a present reality. The Holy Spirit in intrusion has come down and prepared and, in a sense, entered a city. So God lives among us by his Holy Spirit. And Klein mentions that it's only the eyes of faith that can see the city of God in our present time. You can only see it in a sense or perceive it by believing the gospel. The city of man, on the other hand, is, is visible to all. We see the city all around us, of course, and government all around us. And so in Genesis, he's going to trace the apostate city of man. And he calls it that because fallen man will use the city to rebel against God. And he phrases that in two ways. One way man will do this is through the cultic dedication of the state to false gods. And of course, in the Old Testament, the history of nations outside of Israel is the history of a dedication to false gods. But Klein goes on, there's another way, that, and that is the exploitation of the state or of government authority for their own aggrandizement or for their own gain. Klein points out that in both instances, we have the worship of man. Whether man creates idols and demands those idols be served, or man sets himself up as an idol. Either way, Klein says it's autonomy, it's an assertion of, of godlike power, an assertion of deity. And that's what man, sinful man, will end up using this common grace city for. And certainly we see that in the history of our world, don't we, Chris? We sure do. Um, and I, I definitely have some thoughts about that that I, I want to get to. But I was struck by the passage that you were just going through. Sometimes Klein just has a way of putting things that's second to none. I mean, you just can't do any better than that. And so on page 181, he's talking about uh, the the church in the new, the new covenant reality here on the other side of the fall uh, being a present reality, but only by the eyes of faith. And he says, um, More, moreover, even the redeemed of Christ who are still on earth already have their ultimate citizenship and their hidden life of the spirit in that invisible celestial sphere. But in terms of public visibility in this world, that city is yet to come. At present, it is perceived only by eyes whose range of perception has been faith-sensitized to receive rays issuing from the otherwise invisible borders of the light spectrum. So, just one of those places in Klein that impresses me. But uh, with regard to what you were just saying about uh, the exploitation of the state for rulers' own aggrandizement, um, I, I apologize ahead of time if I sound too cynical, but I think we see this in the corruption that we discover in our own government here in the United States and, and other governments around the world. I mean, when we find out, for example, that a politician either introduced legislation or voted for legislation because they were paid to do so by some rich influencer, we see that these politicians are not governing with our best interests at heart. They're, they are, as Klein says, exploiting the state for their own aggrandizement or, you know, in these cases for their own increase in wealth. So. Exactly. And it's interesting that Klein goes back to where the city began, the city of man, and that is Cain. We talked about that last week, that Cain was the first builder in the sense of a city. And it's interesting that Klein says, well, there's an ominous sign if there ever was one, right. that the very first city builder is also the first murderer. <laughs> right. And he's the first murderer of God's people. Mm. And so already we see from Genesis 4, 17, that this city of man, even though God is going to use it in common grace to restrain um, sin at some level, there will be some punishments and to sort of, as we've talked about, help people under the curse by working together, sooner or later, that apostate spirit of man that rebelled against God in the garden, sinful nature, 
will come out and it will come out especially in those who are given more power to control others. And so right away we see that with Cain. And he notes, going back to 417, that even the fact that Cain named the city after his son, Enoch, that's not sort of the way we would say, in a very wonderful way, we dedicate something to our children. Um, Klein says that's a way to show our rebellion Mm. against God when we name something like that. In other words, before the fall, man would have dedicated cities to God would be the point. They would have dedicated what they built to God. But now we see Cain dedicating it not to God, but to his son. And so Klein reads that as, as already a rebellious spirit. And then as we move on through Genesis 4, we come to verse 19. And, and Klein, will, Klein will note at other places where, again, this may be a genealogy with lots of gaps. I mean, he may have narrowed down thousands of years to just some unique special names. And so the world may have been going on much longer. We're not sure. But at the end of Genesis 4, we have verse 23 with Lamech. Mm. And what's unique about Lamech is evil has increased by the time we get to Lamech. Even though in verses 20 through 22, we see the blessings of common grace still continuing. And we have those who build, um, you know, harps and flutes. We have um, those who develop farming. Uh, We have those who are craftsmen. So even though common grace continues, we see this increase of evil. Because Cain at least only had one wife. But now when we move on down, Lamech um, is a polygamist. He has two wives. So already he is perverting uh, the marriage ordinance. And notice with Lamech, and this wasn't said about Cain, he doesn't even use the city to protect citizens. He uses his power to, to take personal vengeance that is anyone who tries to take my life. Mm. So here we have the first recorded tyrant of the city. And in promising to avenge better than God, he's really saying, as Klein points out, that he's more competent than God in achieving justice. So Klein has one of those statements, as you pointed out before on page 184. What a remarkable act of common grace it had been that after the Lord had been obliged to assign cherubim agents to employ the sword to bar sinful man from his sanctuary, he had nevertheless entrusted a sword to these very offenders to be used by them as agents of his justice in this world. Wow. What do you think of that quote? That's a wonderful quote. And it's so, it's so true. I'm struck by, how Klein is able to look past the gross injustice that characterizes Lamech and, and his reign. I mean, it just appears that Lamech is intentionally trying to pervert everything. I mean, the family, the state, whatever he can touch, he's trying to pervert it. And yet Klein looks past that and sees that God will right all wrongs and punish those who do not confess their sin and trust in Christ alone um, I, I think some might be tempted to uh, get caught up in Lamech's sin and want uh, immediate justice against Lamech right here and right now. But uh, I appreciate that, that Klein sees that that's not ultimate and the ultimate uh, justice is coming in the future. Yes, and, and already we see that even though Klein doesn't bring this out right at this time, you have to assume that there's some level of suffering going on for God's people. Right. Because as we talked about earlier, they weren't given a separate city to protect them from all this. Um, They are called to suffer as God allows the Lamex of the world to rule. And so we have to assume that already Christians are in danger and already they, we see their call to suffering until God intervenes with judgment. And that exactly is what happens with the flood. And so Klein points out that God's sword, which he calls the flood God's sword, Mm. 
would prove stronger than Lamex sword. That's just a great line. That's sort of a Star Wars type line. It really is. Isn't it? <laughs> and he goes on to write, the self-styled super gods and the true god would cross swords. And in that duel, God's water sword would assuage the fire of Lamech's blade and snuff out the breath of his nostrils. That's great stuff. It really is. And so what Klein is going to do then, he's going to save Genesis 5, really the very end of Genesis 6, 25 and 26, and then, excuse me, Genesis 4. And then Genesis 5, uh, Moses will develop the Seth's line, which is the city of God, the covenant line. But Klein is going to deal with this thematically. And so he moves on then to Genesis 6 um, as we move through this chapter of Kingdom Prologue. But any other thoughts you have on this two-sword idea that Klein brings out? Just to maybe go back to what I said a minute ago, that uh, even though the flood is a type, it's a miniature picture of the final judgment, Klein sees God's ultimate justice um, as residing in God himself and not in any civil governors. So what Lamech is doing is not ultimate. Uh, And even the flood that God brings in Genesis 6 is not ultimate, but it's pointing us forward to where God will finally deal with all of these injustices. Yes, and I'm also reminded of a comment you made a a moment ago about the city of God can only be seen by the eyes of faith. Mm. Because even here, they sort of disappear in these pages and you wonder where they are. And when we look at the the, um, prophecies throughout the Old Testament about the coming kingdom, the coming city of God that will be on the earth, those have to be interpreted through the eyes of faith. And that really helps us in our all millennial thinking. Because I remember back in Westminster, a Dr. Strimple, I don't know if you had Dr. Strimple, did. did good. And he made the point that the problem with both pre mill and post mill thinking is that both of them look at the newspaper and then they look at the Old Testament prophecies and they say, these can't be happening right now. In other words, they're looking with their eyes and saying, I don't see a kingdom the way it's described in the Old Testament. Right. And he says, the Amil looks at through eyes of faith. The elect continue around the world. God's church is being established. And those kingdom prophecies are being fulfilled in the midst of the city of man, in the midst of sin, in the midst of Lamex. Um, The city of God continues to be built as more and more are saved. But that can only be seen with the eyes of faith. It will not necessarily be seen through um, politics or the changing of society and culture. And I remember when Klein said that, there were a few pre and post mill that weren't very happy. Not Klein, I'm sorry, Strimple. But I think he nailed it. What do you think? I completely agree. You know, as, as a student of history, I can see that there have been times uh, before before us where Christians were tempted to look at events around them and say, uh, this could be it. And I mean, as, as long as we are taking our cues from God's word and allowing it to um, sensitize those eyes of faith, I don't think there's anything wrong with wondering, could this be it? But uh, the fact that so many of those times have come and gone um, I think should caution us to have patience as we endure all the different uh, trials that God sends our way. Right. And so the you think of one of those prophecies, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the world from sea to sea. The pre mill says, well, that's coming in the millennium. The post mill says that's coming in the golden age. And the on mill says, it's here. <laughs> right. You travel all over the world. There are God's people. There are the elect already. The knowledge of the Lord is covering sea to sea. Those prophecies are now. And they began in the book of Acts as the gospel was going out to all the nations. But it takes eyes of faith. 
to see that. We're getting a little bit off topic, but go ahead. No, it's a good, uh, a good rabbit trail here. But I remember uh, Dr. Ba as well saying something to the effect that, oh, there's nothing preventing Christ from returning right now. And I think that supplements what you were just saying. I mean, those prophecies, as we perceive them with eyes of faith, are being fulfilled. Right, exactly. And, and he's going to develop that a little more as we get closer to the flood. But let's move on in Kingdom Prologue where he talks about the cult of divine kings. And it brings us to chapter 6. Remember, he's skipping 5. And next week we'll look back at the city of God. But in chapter 6, he begins to develop this theme of how the apostasy in man will increase until final judgment, as we saw in the, see it here in the old world. And it's that well-known verse. It's very controversial in certain circles because it's difficult to understand. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now Klein's going to develop this and say that the sons of gods or son of God, the sons of God, or as Klein prefers, sons of the gods, refers not to demons or angels, as you may have heard in some circles, or even to Sethite men, which is, a, is an interpretation in some more reformed circles. But these are the sons of the, the sons of the gods are kings. And the reason he says this is because he believes that Genesis 6, 1 is a continuation of chapter 4, verse 24. Because we end in chapter 4, verse 24, with a king, Lamech. He's shaking his fist at God. And then Moses turns to the city of Ma excuse me, the city of God, and he develops Seth line from Adam. Now in chapter 6, we're back to the apostate city, to the city of man. And what do we have again? We have kings shaking their fist at God, or as Klein describes it, more exploits of the royal family. Mm. And so you see the continuity and most people who try to interpret chapter six don't really do a good job of going back to what's been before and how it then connects. And, and so I used to think at one time I held the Sethite view and the more I studied it and I studied Meredith Klein here, I switched over to his view because I think he does the best job of explaining the connection with this passage and what has come previously. And so in chapter 6, 2, what do we have? We have those who call themselves the sons of the gods. They use their power to, um, to obtain even more wives. And so you see this um, continuity with what, with what happened before. You have Adam and Eve were believers, one man and one woman. And then they're unbelievers. I mean, you know, they fall, but then they believe the gospel. So you have a believing marriage. Then you have Cain. He's an unbeliever, but at least he has one wife. So you have an unbelieving marriage, but you have one wife. Then you have Lamech, an unbelieving marriage with a polygamous marriage. So you see this progression. Then you come to chapter 6, and you have those who have set themselves up as gods now they're forcefully developing royal harems, as Klein calls it. They're taking any woman they find pleasing to the eye and forcing them into their harems. So Klein's pointing out you see, this progression that brings us to chapter 6, how bad things have gotten in the world that was in the old world. And so in Hebrew, ben -e ha Elohim, Klein translates as sons of the gods, not sons of gods as if they would be angels or demons who somehow cohabitate with women, which there's no evidence throughout the Bible that is even possible. Right. So Klein is saying they're sons of the gods because that's what they call themselves. And the extra biblical evidence supports this, that the ancient Near Eastern kings consider themselves divine. And so we see their lust for more power, more fame, more obedience, 
And in verse four, he explains that's why they're called men of the name or the mighty men. We might even call them notorious men. So Clyde is developing what's going to happen in the city of man as unbelieving men take on more power and authority. And then, then it makes sense of a passage that is usually very confusing to people. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is one of the many places where I was so appreciative of him providing an explanation that didn't require something really fantastical. I mean, I, the circles that I grew up in definitely um, promoted things like angels and, and human women somehow producing offspring, which I have to admit always caused me to scratch my head. I couldn't figure out <laughs> what that even meant. But um, since the, the phrase B'nai Ha Elohim doesn't clearly translate into something fantastical like that, I just appreciate that Klein is able to be responsible with the biblical data and to provide an explanation that fits with the, the facts of the ancient near East. It, I don't know. To, to me, it, it just makes it, uh, fit. Um, as you were just explaining back with chapter four and the whole theme of, of what's going on in the, the world after the fall. Yes, and his critique of the uh, spirit being's view is that man is the problem here, right. not demons. If it was the demon view, demons would have been the problem. But it's man who is being judged. It's interesting to me, Klein doesn't bring this out, but there's a connection with Adam and Eve in that you know, Eve saw the fruit that it was good. So there's a seeing motif. And then here these men see women who they want and they take it almost like Eve taking the fruit and eating. Interesting. We have, we have that continuation of that, that idea. And Klein also critiques the Sethite view. And if people aren't aware, the Sethite view is that, that, that the sons of God here are the sons of the covenant, the, the line of Seth that were supposed to be believers, but they end up marrying um, women out of the covenant line. And so... The problem with that is Klein says the daughters of men here are women in general, not women of, of one specific line. And then he points out that these other two views really have no context for why Moses would speak of the mighty men in verse four. The giants, as they're called, may not necessarily be those with um, height over others, though that's possible, but mighty in power. And then he points out in Genesis 10, 8, Nimrod, who is a king of Babylon, is called a mighty man. So that connection in Genesis between the mighty men being kings. And he, oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, that was the day when kings would uh, not sit in an ivory tower and send other people off to do the fighting. They were actually leading the armies out into war. So it would make sense that a king would be known as a mighty man. And that was one of the things that impressed me about his, his exegesis of this is that, uh, that, that phrase mighty men really does seem more appropriate for a King than for, uh, uh, granted we do have the Philistines with Goliath, but the context really does seem to, to call for Kings, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, I appreciate that. It's interesting how much Klein devotes to this, um, passage in Genesis 6. It's important to him to develop this that we see, and it may have been because he knew all the bad views out there or the wrong views and he wanted to correct them. But he sees a real crucial theme here that's developed throughout the rest of the Bible. He goes on to explain that the greater context of Genesis connects sonship and kingship. And so God's image bearers in Genesis 2 um, they were to fulfill their sonship by ruling, by ruling as kings. And then in Genesis 6, we see what he calls a satanic perversion of rule, where they would then rule over fallen man for their own benefit to the detriment of man. So Satan is twisting their God-given image bearing of ruling in a good way 
to rule in an evil way. Klein even suggests it's possible that uh, these kings are driven by demons mm. to rule this way. Yeah, but he goes on as we develop um, what, what happens here in verses 3 and 4, that there's some mocking going on here in the way Moses writes. Because even the fact that these so-called sons of gods need human women. You know, if you're really a god, why do you need to produce with human women? Right. So there's a, there's almost a mocking of them. How, how godlike are you <laughs> um, if you have to do that? And then even in verse 3, Klein says, by Moses using the word flesh, he is bringing these men down to the most base level. And I'll quote him on the, in this page. Man, in seeking to participate in the status of immortal deity, succeeded only in getting reduced to the fate of mortal beasts. What a line. What do you think? <laughs> that is a great line. Yeah, I, I think that this is just an escalation, as you've been pointing out, uh, of the sin that... I mean, Granted, started with with Adam and Eve, but um, uh, this also reminds me of something else that we saw earlier on in the in this episode. That um, even Cain's killing of Abel is the very beginning of that enmity that God promised in Genesis three fifteen. I mean, there's the war between the two lines: the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And even as you were pointing out earlier, um, there are believers who are probably suffering under these uh, mighty men who are uh, perverting their role as as rulers and who are uh, forcing these women into their royal harems. But um, there, you just see the the escalation building up to something like an antichrist style uh, crisis. Yes. And that's really the connection between these days and our days, as Jesus points out, as it was before the flood in those days. And we're in those days as we study Genesis six and earlier. So Klein is going to go back, as we said earlier, and develop the city of God for a while. And then in the times ahead, he's going to bring us back to Noah and the flood, but on pages 188 and 189, he summarizes what he has taught about where this city of man will go and its authority. And he says, in general, the state will usually end up monopolizing power over both family and church. That's simply what sinful men, given authority, will do. And in a sense, the city of man will always end up creating an idolatrous theocracy, as he calls it. And really that Satan continues to tempt rulers the way he tempted Adam and Eve. You can be as God. And so when sinful humans are given authority, what will tend to happen um, to, with fallen men? We should, shouldn't be too surprised at this. And so Klein states that we should expect in this, this age before the return of Christ that there will be violent oppression because in Revelation 13, the um, common grace human government is also identified as a beast power, a demon-ridden beast power, as the image is. And therefore, God's people will suffer and be persecuted as they are not given separate cities to live in. But they are called to live under um, the people God has placed in power, um, even though they are fallen. And so the old world by Genesis 6 had reached a level of rebellion where God's redemptive plan is now in danger. We have to assume, as we see this kind of thing in Genesis 6, we're supposed to ask the question, what about God's people? Where are they in all this? What's happening to them? And of course, we find out when we return to Noah. And so God must intervene, and he will with the flood. And so one of the benefits of studying this section of Genesis is, as we said, the comparison 
that Jesus said this age is going to be like the time before Christ returns. Mm. The common grace benefits are continuing, whereas Jesus said they are marrying and giving in marriage and enjoying life, eating and drinking. And yet the church suffers and Christ then returns. And that identifies the age we're in now. So there are so many benefits to studying this, not only um, for personal interest, but to learn about what life is like before the comings of Christ, the pictorial coming of Christ in the flood, and then what it pictured, final judgment. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's so helpful. I mean, Klein also has said that our situation in the, in the new covenant is closer to say the, the patriarchs like Abram uh, in, in Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, maybe even into chapter 17. But um, I sure appreciate the reminder that our situation also parallels this time before the flood, because you're right. Um, there are, New Testament comparisons between the final judgment and uh, the flood. And it's just interesting that Genesis reports. It doesn't really seem to um, praise anybody or condemn anybody. It's just giving us a report of what happened. And so I appreciate what you just said that, it should be prompting us to ask the question, well, well, where are God's people? And maybe they're under somebody's thumb. <laughs> um, and so we shouldn't be surprised to, to find ourselves under somebody's thumb in our present context. Yeah, and you always have people ask, whether in your church or elsewhere, do you think persecution is coming in the United States? And really, we can look at the Bible and, and what we know about fallen man and say, yes. It is just the nature of things. It's the cycle of nations. It's um, we're promised it. And so when we have a measure of freedom like we do now, um, we should be very thankful because many people throughout history, Christians, have not experienced such freedom. And we don't know how long it will last. Um, and, it, and it doesn't mean that somehow the church has failed and if the church had done its job better, there wouldn't be any persecution and et cetera, et cetera. We're already told to expect it. We're told this is the nature of fallen man when he's given authority. And that doesn't mean we try our best to, um, to plead with them not to do it or, we, you know, we, we don't pray for persecution. But at the same time, our expectations should be realistic simply based on the pattern we see back in Genesis don't you think? Absolutely. And I think that's a really wise way to respond to people too. Um, I mean, obviously for all of the, the frustrations and the complaints that we have in a place like the United States, none of us is in Fikret Bocek's situation where we're about to be arrested and sent to prison for the rest of our lives for preaching the gospel. Amen. So we can, we can be thankful for that, but we should remember that Fikret's not the first one either. I mean, this has been happening throughout history, even probably in the, the period of human history that we're reading about here in Genesis 6. Yeah, we saw the people who were wiped out in Nigeria, the Christians, mm. last week, and the government stood by. And so in that sense, that's Christian persecution. It's happening all over. And we're told to expect it. But yeah, at the same time, be very thankful when we can live our lives in peace. So there's a lot here. And it's going to be fun to move from here to talk about God's people now in the midst of all this and how that develops and what it means then to be a believer in this common grace world. Whereas Klein said, there's a sense we can learn more from this section of Genesis in some ways than we can from the believers in Israel mm. who, were, who were given a theocracy because their situation pre-theocracy is our situation. 
So that's going to be fun to get to. That may be a good place to stop. I think you're right. I, I in just to maybe piggyback off of that for a moment, you just think about how believers in Genesis chapter six probably couldn't even have conceived of a situation like Israel entered into at Mount Sinai. It just wasn't part of their experience. And uh, they had to learn patience and just uh, waiting on God's timing by enduring the the various trials and tribulations that, that came up in their lives. And uh, wow, what a, a lesson we can learn from them. Yeah, you could see by what you said that when God comes to Sinai and separates a nation for himself, I mean, that's intrusion. Yes. I'm going to give you a picture of the eternal city when people will be separated from me forever. Now, and it will just be an intrusion because obviously when Christ comes, that arrangement is destroyed. But what a great picture um, of God saving a people eternally for himself mm. and, and a city, a city of God. So a lot to get to. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for the discussion, Todd. I really appreciated it. I did too. It was fun. Okay, everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in this week. And I would like to encourage everyone again to go to the show notes page at meredithkline.com slash podcast episode 78 and fill out that uh, survey. That would really help us. Uh, you can email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet us at glorycloudpod and I am at Machen Guy. And we will continue the discussion next week. 